Nearly 60% of couples with children have two parents who work outside the home. I think we need to recognize the incredible challenges that so many parents face, particularly working moms. I don't think people ask me to be speaker so that I can take more money from hardworking taxpayers to create some new federal entitlement. Women are leaving the workplace not because they want to, but because the math doesn't add up when you don't have paid leave. It's crazy that America is not offering this and every other country is. I'm calling on Congress. Take a cue from the rest of the world. Work together in a bipartisan fashion. Find a way to make paid leave, paid family and medical leave a reality for all Americans. The United States is the only industrialized nation in the world that doesn't have a federal law mandating paid maternity leave. I was fortunate enough to have a job that offered paid maternity leave when I had a child, but most Americans aren't so lucky. 88% of American women do not get paid for a single day or a single hour after giving birth. We wanted to learn why lawmakers haven't guaranteed paid leave in the US, and we wanted to see what life is like for women in a country with the most generous maternity leave policy and a country that is arguably the worst for new moms. The crisis over the lack of paid maternity leave has profound effects on the lives of American women and their children. Amber Scora wrote a deeply personal article in the New York Times after her three-month-old son, Carl, died during his first day in daycare. I mean, I think about Carl, I think, almost every minute. And I wonder, like, would he be crawling now? And that's not going to ever end, because when he would have gone to school, I would be thinking, like, all the kids outside, those would have been his playmates. And when he would have graduated, like, there's just no end to it. How long has it been now? What month is it? Oh, it's four months, yeah. Did you know your company's maternity leave policy when you started working there? Uh, yeah, it's kind of notorious for being quite good compared to most companies. They give you three months at full pay. After that, you go back to work, but you only have to work three days a week for the first eight weeks that you're back. Was it an option that one of you could stay home or no? My partner, Lee, couldn't stay home because he makes more than I do. And I definitely considered staying home. But the difficulty was that my job had the health insurance tied to it. Can you tell me a little bit about your first day back? I hadn't even had a babysitter since he was born, so it felt unnatural and I didn't want to do it, but I realized that most of the people I knew had left their babies earlier than I had had to. So, you know, you just kind of feel like you're part of this system that although you don't really want to do it, you kind of, that's what everyone does, and so you sort of resign yourself to it. I had told the daycare lady I would come back between 12 and 12.30 to feed Carl, and by 12.10, I was like, I couldn't wait anymore. So I, I left work. And I ran, I literally ran to the daycare because I was so excited to see Carl. When I rounded the corner into the daycare, Carl was um, laid out on a changing table and the owner was performing CPR on him and his lips were blue and around his mouth it was all blue. So obviously it was really, the shock, I mean, there's just no way to kind of comprehend that because you had no warning. And I mean, you don't want to admit it to yourself because you still can't even understand what's going on or comprehend how it could happen. So I asked the owner of the daycare a lot of questions, obviously. She said that she had given him a bottle and decided to put him down to go to sleep. And then he quieted him down and that she just assumed that he had fallen asleep which obviously bothered me because I thought that it was his first day, she didn't know him, it would be better if he was checked on to make sure everything was okay, seeing as that was unusual. And I had told her that was not his usual way of falling asleep. What did they say the cause of death was? Um, it was undetermined. They couldn't find anything wrong with him, which was completely, like the, maybe the worst response too, because then you, help, you will never know why your child died, which is a really difficult thing to live with. Uh, like in the first week, I can hardly remember, honestly, because um, there's just, I think your mind can't make sense of it. Your breasts become engorged with milk and your baby is gone. 
For a long time, I just left his clothes exactly as they were, and it took a long time before I could ever deal with moving anything from where it had been, because you that's all you have left of your child at that point. My mother's intuition was that leaving Carl at that age was wrong, and I knew it, and yet I still did it, and I was mad at myself for doing that, but I was also mad because I felt that there was really no choice but to have some kind of childcare. In your article, you say that, you know, this, it, it wasn't uh, a criticism of your company's maternity leave plan. It wasn't a criticism of the care that was provided by the daycare center, but more about the culture that expects us to go back to work real, like almost immediately after giving birth. I started to read online, just research about parental leave, and I started to come across uh, a lot of women's stories. I mean, there were women that, like, two days after a cesarean had to go back to work. Oh my God. Yeah, women who had to leave their babies in the NICU uh, to go back to work. And I remember as I was reading it, I started to feel guilty thinking, oh, like who am I to complain? Look, I got three months, you know, paid. Um, and then I thought, how crazy is that, that like my baby died and I'm even feeling like I should be grateful for what I got. And then I also, of course, realized that every country in the world has parental leave as a norm. According to a 2014 International Labor Organization report, there are only two nations that don't provide cash benefits for maternity leave, the United States and Papua New Guinea. The next worst ranked nations offer a minimum of 12 weeks. Sweden, which ranks among the best in the world, offers 60 weeks of paid leave, under the Family and Medical Leave Act, the United States guarantees three months of unpaid leave to a small subset of the workforce, those who've been employed for a year or more at a company with at least 50 employees. There really is no federal law creating paid maternity leave in the United States. And if you are at the lower end of the income scale, you're less likely to have access to paid maternity leave. If you're a woman of color, you're less likely to have access to paid maternity leave. The lack of paid maternity leave also contributes to the gender wage gap. American women typically earn about 90% of what men are paid until they hit age 35, right in the middle of their child rearing years. American women's wages then stagnate while men's continue to rise. So by the time women are 45 years old, they're earning 77 cents for every dollar men earn. Anne Marie Slaughter understands the pressures on American working families. After leaving her job at the U.S. State Department to have more time with her sons, she wrote a book called Unfinished Business, which advocates for better work-family balance. What we're doing is driving women out of the workforce or forcing them to work in a way where they're incredibly stressed. This is an economic issue, and we've seen that in the United States. We just haven't recognized it. The growth in our GDP since the 1970s was in large part caused by women going into the workforce. So if women now come out, or if they're underemployed, if we're not promoting them as much as we should, if we're not taking advantage of their talent. We are losing out as a society. Do you think that the onus should be on companies to provide leave, or do you think that the U.S. should step in? I think the government has to do this. A growing number of companies are providing paid leave, but they're high-end companies. Uh, and for the vast majority of American women, their companies aren't gonna do it. The government has to say, we are a society that values reproduction, and we are going to ensure that you can reproduce without losing your job or losing your pay. This is the only nation where it's a partisan issue. The absence of federal paid leave policies has enormous social costs and economic costs to our society. When kids and parents have time to bond at home, the return on investment is priceless. Emily James is a mother who's spending her life savings just so she can stay home after the birth of her second child. They give this maternity workshop in Queens. It was just like, look, you don't get this. You don't get this. You don't get this. You don't get this. And all the women were just sort of like, shocked. I knew that it wasn't anything great that we got, but I didn't realize that it was, it was nothing. Which side do you want to wear? The white bird part or the black? The tiger's When you work for the New York City Department of Education, you do not get paid maternity leave. We've had to use our savings 
to be home. It's worth it. It's the best $20,000 that I'll probably ever spend. But by the time that I go back to work, that savings will be depleted, which is pretty scary. It doesn't really make sense that you have to sacrifice so much just to raise your kids. And with my first daughter, when I did go back to work after 12 weeks, I was exhausted. I feel like I gave her a shell of myself even at that point, and she was so young. I worked the second shift, which is 4 p.m. to 12 a.m. We kind of tag teamed. I got home right at the second that he left for work. We were both alone all day or all night with the baby by ourselves and then working the other half of the time. So it was really exhausting, and it's, a, it's hard on a relationship, too. I mean, we basically just try to give each other naps. That's basically how you say I love you at that point is like, you know, you can go take a nap now. Let's go near the bench so mommy can sit with Allie. I have been on maternity leave about six months. Unfortunately, I do notice a difference in the bonding with the two girls. My second daughter, she receives all of me. Obviously, you love them both with all your heart. That goes without saying. But... I do see a real difference in the way that you kind of prosper as a mom when you can make that your full-time job. Wanna go higher? Yeah! Okay. So he recently finished his degree and now could look for higher paying jobs, but if he were to find a different higher paying job that didn't have those hours of four to midnight, then we would have to find daycare, so it would be another 20, $1,000 a year or something. I can't even, it's an astronomical amount of money that you'll have to pay out. And I wouldn't get to see my kids grow up. It's the entire reason I had kids was to be there with them when they were young. That time is invaluable. Senator Kirsten Gillibrand has proposed a bill called the Family Act, which would mandate three months paid leave nationwide. The rules of the workplace are really stuck in the 1950s and 60s, where there's this assumption that dads go to work and moms stay at home. Well, that's just not true. There has to be a recognition that eight out of 10 moms are working. So can you explain a little bit about the Family Act? The gold standard is to get three months leave. That is what I'm fighting for in this bill. Our bill will allow workers to get up to 66% of their wages uh, pre-tax, which I think is almost a full wage. We want people to buy in over their lifetimes so it's there when they need it. So it's there on a gender neutral basis and it's there whether you're working part-time or full-time. And so you'd put about $2 a week into your account. Your employer would match that. This allows workers to take the time they need when they need it, to be at businesses to be able to retain that worker, have high morale, have high productivity. And we know this works. We have states that have already done this. So far, only three states have implemented paid maternity leave programs. California, New Jersey, and Rhode Island. If you look at California, 90% of businesses said it had a positive effect or no negative impact, and 87% said no cost. These are huge indicators of how valuable this program is. Sounds like it's more of a drain on the economy to not have paid leave. For the replacement workers alone, billions of dollars. For the uh, earning uh, power that's lost, the lack of spending, trillions of dollars. It is a huge drag on the economy. And then for all those parents who are forced onto public assistance, it's something we all pay for. So it would be better to have a national paid leave policy because it would create economic growth. I think it's the most significant untapped economic potential we could do in the nation today. You're one of the few legislators that has small children. How has this informed the way that you think about this issue? I think it makes a huge difference because I know how valuable it was to me to have a time with my newborn. That made a huge difference to me emotionally, to physically, to my child's future. I had the flexibility to take the leave I needed. I had the resources to be there when I needed to be. Most parents don't. Some families are forced into poverty after experiencing the birth of a child. And as a mother, how does that make you feel? Well, I think it's outrageous. And I've seen what this looks like. I had a former employee who, in her first job, she was a waitress. She had no sick days. When she got pregnant, her employer said, you're going to have to quit because I'm not giving you any leave. Because her employer wouldn't do right by her, she was forced to go on public assistance that 
we as taxpayers pay for. And in, in fact, almost 40% of women who don't have access to paid leave have to go on public assistance. Uh, what happens often is women and men have to ramp off their careers, uh, maybe quit a job uh, or try to get rehired after that life event is over. Uh, and often they get hired for less wages in a less senior position. And it often happens to women. And it's one of the reasons why women make up two thirds of minimum wage earners. So you're basically saying if you're someone who cares about your family, if you're somebody who accommodates those family emergencies, you're not going to earn your full potential. At the core of this, you're saying this is a family values issue, but it's not typically supported by Republicans who also say that they're about family values. Why is that? If you ask people around, do you want paid leave? They're going to say yes. But a lot of times politicians are in a bubble. A lot of uh, elected leaders are extremely affluent. They have full-time caregivers when they need them. They just don't understand how important these kinds of policies are for regular families in their districts or in their states. While most Democrats agree on mandating paid family leave, many Republicans are concerned it would be a drain on taxpayers and hurt small businesses. The Heritage Foundation, a conservative think tank with significant influence on U.S. policymaking, staunchly opposes government intervention. Men and women make different choices at times. Uh, more women do decide to take time off from the workforce to raise their family, whether it's two years, five years, however long they decide to do it. And that can affect their ability to work to rise up the, the ladder. But that's a choice that women should have the right to make. Can you tell me about the Heritage Foundation? What do you guys do here? Well, the Heritage Foundation is a think tank. We've been around since 1973. And we develop policy ideas for members of Congress, for governors, for the executive branch, I mean, we want freedom and opportunity for all. And that's why in many issues, we don't think things like mandates on whether it's a business or a person or a group is the right way to go. People should be free to thrive. What does the Heritage Foundation think about paid maternity leave? The Heritage Foundation believes that employers ought to be able to develop their own policies for their workplace. If you're somebody who's working somewhere and you're a good employee, they're going to find ways to say, it's great that you want to go raise your children, but gosh, I hope you come back three months from now, or I hope you come back a year from now. And that's, I think, the kind of spirit that we want to see. And it's kind of the free market at work. Is it exactly where it needs to be? No, but I don't think there's anybody out there that's doing it better than America does. Do you see the lack of paid maternity leave as contributing to the gender wage gap? I don't. And if you're somebody who decides whether you're a man or a woman to take two years out of, out of the workforce to either raise a family or go pursue some hobby that you have whatever the reason is, you're going to be two years probably behind the same person who continued in that particular field. But that's a choice that people decide to make. And for many people, it's well worth it. They would rather have that time with their family than follow a particular, a particular career track. So you see a federally mandated paid maternity leave policy as hurting women, potentially. Putting in mandates, whether it's a small employer or a large employer, they're going to find the way to, to recoup those costs. And in many cases, they recoup it by taking out of the base salary of the employee. And what you find is that oftentimes women end up getting lower salaries than they were getting before if a business is being forced to, to pay additional benefits. Uh, and you also can make it more difficult for women to get hired in the first place. If an employer knows this is a woman of childbearing age, I hire her versus this person, I'm going to probably have to pay maternity benefits. That can hurt her chance of getting a job. And I know that, you know, that's not legal to do, but it's very hard to prove that that's the reason an employer made a decision. So I think mandates are not going to do what many people want them to do. They sound good, but at the end of the day, they hurt the very people that we say we're trying to help. It's clear that this is viewed as a partisan issue. So unless the public demands action, it seems unlikely that there will ever be a federal mandate covering all Americans. To see if states can remedy this issue on their own, we're traveling to California, which has arguably the best parental leave insurance policy in the nation. We are in LA and we are on our way to go see a woman who's expecting twins and she's in her third trimester. And we're gonna go ask her how she's dealing with maternity leave. We knew when we first met that we wanted to have kids. I've wanted to have a child since I was little. I knew that was my calling in life. So how far along are you? 30.5 weeks. So seven and a half months pregnant. And were there 
there any complications? I was already high risk because I'm expecting twins. Mm -hmm. And then at 19 weeks, they put me on modified bed rest because I had a shortened cervix, which puts me at high risk for preterm labor. Mm -hmm. When I got put on modified bed rest, I asked if I could work from home and they said no. Why, like did they explain? Apparently there's a no work from home rule. Okay. Even though that's not in our manual and a lot of people work from home. Okay. And I had already been working from home. So I had to go into the office every day. My doctor did say he preferred I didn't go to work after 19 weeks. Mm -hmm. And I said financially, I can't do that. I have to go. He was like, if you have to, then you go. But you have to be careful. When I was at work and I would get stressed out, I would start having contractions. If I had gone into labor, they would not be viable. That was my biggest fear, to lose them because financially I couldn't follow my doctor's orders. That would have killed me. And I did have a scary moment where I thought I was going into labor at 24 weeks. Oh, wow. And so I knew it was time for me to go. And as soon as I stopped, and I was just doing what they told me, which is basically sitting all day long. I stopped having contractions. My cervix started lengthening. It's been like this complete 180. Now they think I'm gonna go beyond full term because I've listened to them. What's your maternity leave plan like for your company? There's no paid maternity leave. I had saved this whole year and I hadn't taken any of my sick days and I hadn't taken really any of my vacation days because I knew that I needed all the pay I could get. Mm -hmm. I still have to go through state disability and it's only, I think, 55% of what you make. I get what I'm on right now because I'm disabled by pregnancy for eight weeks. In between when that ends and when I give birth, I'll probably have two or three weeks of no pay at all. And then once I give birth, then I can get 55% through the state for an additional six weeks. Once that's over, I'll probably use whatever excess of vacation I have left, if I have any. And if I don't, I'm just going to wing it and figure something out financially, or I go back to work. Do you have a plan for childcare for, for when the time comes to return to work? I mean, it's, I don't know. I mean, we're probably looking at spending about three grand a child per month. I, don't, I have no idea how we're gonna do that. I really don't. <laughs> Even with California's comparatively generous family leave insurance program, it still leaves mothers like LB vulnerable. As bad as it is here, we wanted to see what it was like in the only other nation consistently cited in reports on maternity leave policy is on par with the United States, Papua New Guinea. Like the US, PNG only guarantees paid maternity leave to government employees. But unlike the US, the nation is quite young with only 40 years of independence. Up until 1933, the country's currency was seashells. Papua New Guinea also has extremely high rates of gender violence, making it quite possibly one of the worst places in the world to be a woman. 50% of women have reported experiencing forced sex or gang rape. Two thirds of women report being survivors of domestic violence, which means they are 16% more likely to give birth to a low weight baby. You know, this is a country that missed every single one of the Millennium Development Goals. Very few countries in the world did that. So it's not a great record. 36% of our population live on less than $1.25 a day. We have very high levels of infant mortality, high levels of women dying in childbirth. Why is it that women have a higher instance of dying in childbirth here? 85% of the population of the country live in rural areas. Everywhere you go in the country, you have to fly, pretty much. There are very few roads and infrastructure and so on. In many of these remote areas, people don't have access to medical facilities. In some places, you will walk for literally 20, 30 miles to be able to find a trained doctor who can provide a really good service in case if there are any complications. So given the state of maternal health in general and the participation of women in the formal economy, how high of a priority is paid maternity leave in Papua New Guinea? The government here and people here do aspire to have paid maternity leave for people in the formal sector, but at the moment, most of our people are not in the formal economy. And so it would be some time 
before that is really prioritized in our country, things are improving, but they're improving from a very, very low base. This is the Geru Market, which is uh, one of the project sites for the UN Women's Safe City project. Women face a lot of sexual harassment and different forms of violence, especially in public spaces. So our project is basically to ensure women feel safe when they are here. How many women sell things here? Say 200 women. And women get to bring their kids here? Yes. Most women who come to sell their products have kids and they also wanted a safe space where you know they could look after their children as well as do their marketing. Mm -hmm. So that was considered when they did the rebuilding of the infrastructures here and you could see at the back there's the playground for the kids. Can you speak to me a little bit about gender-based violence? It has changed for the worse. I mean, you know, traditional times, we, we women were grass cats, and there wasn't a rape or anything like that. Women had value with the cash economy, etc. the use of power and money to exact control over women. We have no respect for women anymore, and you could see the high rates of violence we have in these cases. There has been recent studies which discovered that almost 100% of women in the highlands have experienced domestic violence. And because we don't really have a lot of um, support services available, women would just live with the violence and it becomes normalized. So what was the incidence rate like of sexual assault at the marketplace before you and women got involved? When we interviewed the market vendors, over 90% said they have experienced some form of sexual harassment or sexual violence. There hasn't been any reported cases of violence in this marketplace since we started this project. Why did you come to live in Port Moresby? All my cousins, they went to school. I was left behind. When my dad heard about me that I wasn't going to school, he brought me here and he put me to school. After finishing my grade six, I had my firstborn child, my daughter, I gave birth again and my second child died. 2011, I gave birth to another child, he also died. Until now, we are staying together with my parents. Do you feel safe walking alone no, as a woman? No, not really, no. 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 Do you think rape is a problem in Papua New Guinea? Yes, it happened once to me. To you? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. It's all right. I was with my boyfriend. He was going to leave me at my uncle's house, and a group of boys came, surrounded us, and my they took me. They took me, and my 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 boyfriend ran away. Did the police come? Yes, they came. When they came, those guys they ran away. Did they ever find the guys? No. No. Do you worry about the safety of your daughter? Of course. Mm -hmm. Does she ever travel alone? No. no. <laughs> it's a, it's a really hard life for women here, and. Um, she couldn't even like walk down the street with her boyfriend. Like she was with her boyfriend when she got like gang raped. And uh, so mm -hmm. it's um, you know, it's like you look at all the little girls running around, and you think there's like a ninety percent chance that that's gonna happen to them. They're like these little kids, and they're just like really happy and on the playground. And um, I don't know what the future holds for them. Now we're heading up to the highlands to Karawagi Health Clinic to see what conditions are like for women giving birth in rural areas. The 
This is the uh, Keragi Health Center. It's a big health center for the district. When was it built? It was built in the 1970s. How many people does it serve? Uh, about 14 to 16,000. Do people mm. come from long distances to yeah, come here? Yeah, they do come from long distances. Mm -hmm. Some even climb mountains, cross rivers when they're sick. Or when they're pregnant? Pregnant and uh, when babies are sick. Is the ambulance? Yeah, that's the ambulance for the health center. And do you guys pick up pregnant women sometimes? Yes, when they give a call, then we go and pick them up. Now this is the reception area. So it's dark in here. Why is yeah. it dark? It's dark because we have recurrent uh, blackouts. How many nurses are usually on duty? In the morning, we have two to four nurses working. In the evening, we have two or one. In the night, too, because we are short staffed at the moment. For emergency cases, they refer them to the base hospital. How far away is that? About 10 kilometers. This is the maternity ward. When's the last time a baby was born here? Two days ago. I delivered one and another one was a bridge. If it had come early, we should have referred, but it came very late. We did all our best, but the baby died. Oh, that's anyway, so sad. That's very sad, yeah. Why did you decide to become a midwife? To prevent the maternity mortality death, to reduce the number. To help women? Yeah. Mm. What's like the typical complication you encounter here? Postpartum hemorrhage. Yeah. They bleed after delivery. Do they die when that happens, or are you able to stop the bleeding? No, we manage them here, and so they, uh, they don't die. How do people pay for services here? Is it free? Do they have to pay money? Yeah. No, the government put a policy that services are free. How many babies have you delivered? More than 100 or something, but I cannot think. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't keep a record. <laughs> you, haven't kept, <laughs> you haven't kept track. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have kids? I have four. So when you had your baby, uh, you, you weren't able to work? No, I had my leave. So you did get maternity leave? Yes. And was it paid? We were on the normal pay. Normal pay, so it was like 100% pay? Yes. And is that common among like mm. people you know? Every uh, public servant is entitled to a uh, rec leave, six weeks, and maternal leave is 12 weeks. 12 weeks? Six weeks before delivery and six weeks after delivery. Okay. Did you feel like you really needed that? My husband is not working and I'm working. Mm -hmm. So what if, if I don't, I'm not on the pay, and then what? How will I help my family? How will we gonna be fed? Mm -hmm. so, so you really needed it? Yes, we yeah. really, really need the money. While this health clinic is pretty crude, clearly the government is making efforts to improve maternal health. Providing doctors, nurses, and midwives with paid maternity leave is a huge step in the right direction, even if it does only cover a very small percentage of the population. Still, given the long distances to rural health centers, one out of every 110 women die in childbirth. Anna Rita offered to introduce us to a mother whose twins she had delivered just days earlier. When were your babies born? Saturday, a week. And they're both girls? Yes. What are their names? This one, Lian, Lillian. Beautiful. Are you married? Yeah. Is your husband here? He's working, so. Oh, he's working? What does he do? Driving. Drives a truck? Truck. Oh, OK. Yeah. Is he happy with having twins? Yes. He has all his girls? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> How far along into your pregnancy did you figure out you were pregnant? About six months. Oh, six months. Mm. Oh, wow. What's your follow-up care like? In the hospital, we just kept them for just 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And then on the next day, they decided. We don't do follow-ups here. Do you have a, you had a gash here? Did you fall or something? The first one. They separated, but she had that she was having the twins, she was jealous or something like this. So she came the day after. Oh my God. She was not expecting it. Yeah. Surprisingly, she was. Oh my God. Did you call the police? Mm. You don't think the police could help? No. How did you get her to leave? We just said, uh, uh, fight, she will. Yeah, was your husband here when that happened? He was driving. He was driving. Mm -hmm. mm. Is there anything that you can do to stop it? To make it stop this, I will build it. Can you tell me a little bit more about yourself? Like, did you go to school? I did complete my grade 12. And when my children are big enough, I will go back to school. What kind of work do you want to do? 
to be in yes. this. What do you hope for your little girls? I want them to go to school and have a good job. I don't want them to get married and no. have this kind of life I'm having. With the endemic levels of violence that women face, there's still a lot to be done to improve mothers' lives in Papua New Guinea. What we say is if you educate a woman and you educate a country, a nation. How do you feel about the status of women in Papua New Guinea? I think we have changed a lot. A lot of women are getting educated. I keep on educating my two daughters to be financially independent before they can think into settling down. What are some of the priorities of the Department of Health? Maternal health, child health. In the 90s, it was not openly spoken about, but now through the process of education, my daughter came and asked, Mom, what's vagina? You know, loudly among all the uncles. How old was so, she? She was about 14. And then I was, you know, in between, whether to say shh or, you know, explain. But I have to explain, so because she had the right to know. Mm -hmm. We went to Karawagi. The midwives told us that they actually receive paid maternity leave. The government of Papua New Guinea has the general order, breastfeeding time for mothers, and then maternity leave paid for the public servants, regardless whether you're a teacher, you're a nurse, you're a midwife, you're, as long as you're under the public service, it applies. In America, teachers, nurses, they don't receive paid maternity leave. And I want us to know what you thought about that. That's not fair to the family because that's not supportive of the family. If the child that, uh, you know, I'm going to bear is going to contribute to the society, the government must have a share in supporting the parents. After speaking with women here, it's shocking to see the levels of violence they face each day. And although a tiny percentage of women have paying jobs, at least PNG's national paid maternity leave policy is broad enough to include teachers, nurses, and doctors, professions still not covered in the U.S. It seems pretty obvious that a nation as wealthy as ours should not have the same maternity leave policy as a nation that still struggles to provide the most basic of services. But in fact, we do. Now, unfortunately, only Congress has the power to give this security to all Americans. But where I can act, I will. Just as Papua New Guinea covers its public servants, in January 2015, President Obama granted federal employees six weeks of paid family leave. It was progress, but not a solution for all working women. This policy still leaves millions of workers, like Lauren Spurgeon, vulnerable. Lauren went into labor three months early, and her premature daughter has been hospitalized in the infant intensive care unit ever since. Nothing is quite like having a baby at 26 weeks. It's just unreal. My placenta actually became detached from my uterus. It was either they take the baby or risk both their lives. No choice. Of course, I had her C-section, so I was in recovery. She was two pounds, 2.9 ounces. They discharged me, and at that point, she was still in the OR. She was only a week old. So she stayed here, and I went home, which was the hardest day of my life, you know, having to leave your newborn baby in a hospital and not knowing when she's going to come home is agonizing. When you have a baby this young and they're so immature, you really want to get it in your head that you're going to be here till you're 40 weeks. So I'm normally down here all day and I don't get home until mm -hmm. sometimes 10, mm -hmm. 11 o'clock at night. We have two young children at home, and he works full time. There you are. Yes. There you are. The most difficult part of this whole situation is not being able to see the baby every day, because I have to go back home and be with the kids, cook them dinner, all that stuff. By the time I'm done with that and put them down, it's too late. I really can't go out to see her, because I got to get up the next day and, and go to work. Did you get maternity leave? I got eight weeks of maternity leave from disability and then paid family leave, which was six weeks. And I'm coming to the end of that. I mean, it's just like crazy that your leave 
was basically used up before she's even yeah. at yes. home. Yeah. Do you know what the aftercare is gonna you be don't, like? You don't. She'll need to see the pediatrician on a weekly basis. She's probably gonna need to see the cardiologist. So we'll be making weekly trips to San Diego until she's, I think, three to six months. How do you make it to those appointments and how do you know that everything's gonna be okay? Without being home full time. Without being home full time. Is there anyone that would even really be like qualified to take care of her if you were to go back to work in like two weeks when, yeah. you know, she comes home? No. Yeah. Unless I take one of these fine nurses home with me, there's just nobody else qualified. You need to learn this way. The only thing that you can do is put in the time at the hospital to make sure that you go home knowledgeable you can't just say, oh, you know, come to the house and I'll train you. It just doesn't happen like that. We've been here two and a half months. I couldn't deal with knowing that I left my child with somebody who was incapable of taking care of her just so that I could work. I can't. How would you guys manage financially if you had to do that? It could mean maybe even going on some you know, assistance from the state. And ho hopefully we'll even qualify for that then. I don't know yet at this point, but anything's worth it for, to be able to take care of my own little girl. The babies that have contact with their parents <laughs> seem to have the physiologic signs of feeling more comfortable. And we interpret that as being a good sign for both development and healthcare. In your experience, have there been parents who have to return to work before their baby is sent home from the NICU? Yeah, very often it's where the mom is the only caretaker or wage earner in the household. Can you tell me why it's important for a mother to be with her newborn child? An enormous amount of development takes place after birth. And this is based on input from the mother, the father, and the environment. So a good home life and interaction with the mother is very, very important for development of the nervous system. To see the other end of the spectrum, we're traveling to Sweden, which prides itself on gender equality. The first nation to institute paid maternity leave, today it has one of the best maternity and paternity leave policies in the world. As we say in Europe sometimes, we can't afford to have the best educated housewives in the world. Mm -hmm. We are the world's first feminist government in Sweden right now. Women are represented almost by 50% in Swedish politics. In the decision making, we always look at the gender perspective. Could you explain Sweden's paid parental leave policy? We have had parental uh, insurance put in place since 1974 in Sweden. It is 480 days for each child, and it's divided between the parents. So each parent has his or hers individual right to 240 days. We made it possible for the parents to, to give their days over to the other parent. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, fathers still don't take out their share and of course this affects women. So 60 days have been reserved for each parent that you can't give over to the other parent. This parental insurance is available to anybody who has a job. You don't need to have a job. Of course then, uh, then compensation will be lower because I mean this is a compensation for income loss. But it also has a, a, a ground protection or a floor. So where do the funds come from for the parental insurance? It's financed from taxation, but a part of that taxation comes from a social security fee that is paid by the employer. This is something that is widely accepted in the Swedish society. And there is a willingness to pay taxes because you see that you really benefit from this. What are some of the other benefits that Swedish parents receive from the government? Free childcare, free schools, including university, free healthcare, child allowances, of course, for all children. Can you explain a little bit how Sweden has gained from having this policy? We have among the highest rates when it comes to labor market participation among women in the world now. And this, of course, has also increased the growth in the Swedish economy. Young women in Sweden today expect definitely to get the same possibilities as young men.
Sweden is also the first country with a political party rooted in the principles of feminism. Founded in 2005, today the Feminist Initiative holds municipal seats throughout the country and a seat in the European Parliament. Can you explain the background of the Feminist Initiative for me? Well, there was a number of groups, for example, women's rights groups, those peace movement groups, anti-racist group, LGBT right groups, etc., that all had feminism on the agenda. We decided that we wanted to try to make it a parliament, and we formed the party, and obviously we decided on the intersectional perspective. And there was no hesitation to call yourselves feminist? No. No. Absolutely, that's what we are. We are the Feminist Initiative. <laughs> Where does the Feminist Initiative stand on parental leave? Our foundation, if I would look at parental leave, is from the perspective of the child and not mm -hmm. from parents' rights and not necessarily biological parents' rights either, but the uh, people that will sort of step in and take parental responsibility. I have a friend, she's having a child with a gay married couple, so they're going to be three parents. Oh, wow. It's like redefining families. Yes, absolutely. We want to see parental leave individualized, so it's split down half. There's still expectations, like, you know, if I should take a personal example, I started working, not full-time, but part-time, when my kids were between three and six months. My then-husband, of course, stepped in. I very often got the sort of question like, don't you like children? Mm. Why did you even get kids if you don't want to stay home? Whereas he, of course, got the like, oh, you're a great dad and you're really stepping in to take care of your kids and it's, you know, you're a really good guy, you know. For that to change, we need also to change how we share both the care for the home, the children, and how we divide time in or out of work. Mm -hmm. Life is children, family, relationships, and work, and, you know, should be able to allow it all for all genders because all genders are parents and all children should have right to their parents. In Sweden we have a system that is, you should do 50-50, and it's every man's right to be with their kids. <laughs> Especially with my oldest son, who's always been very mommy kind of boy, it could have been easy like me to just disappear and say, no, go to her. Hey, Leslie. Gig. Gig. But I've been with him just as much as he has, and I think that will make him a better person and make me a better person as well, you know, being close to him. What do you think about America not having a parental leave plan? I'm always shocked when my Swedish friends that are living in the States, they almost always come home when it's time for the kids to start school or something like that, because then it's not worth it anymore. You have a system that demands a family to uh, help you, basically, and we have a system that society helps us. The best thing about being at home is this. We just hang out. Of course I am a part of a bigger change in Sweden. A lot of my friends are on parental leave. Amongst my closest friends, I can't think of anyone who hasn't been home with their kids. And of course, I am proud of the system that uh, we have in Sweden uh, because I know it's unique. What can I say? Of course, it's amazing. So how long have you been on paternity leave? Two months. And how long do you intend to take? 11 months, okay. total and all. I wasn't supposed to be as much at home with you well as it turned out to be because she got a job opportunity and there was like two weeks notice. And for me it was, uh, okay, of course I step in. So there wasn't even really much of a conversation? No, or no, like, no, 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 like, no, 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 no. More of like, good for you. Great chance, great opportunity. This is my office, Mama Magazine, where we produce a monthly magazine for mothers with children in between the ages zero and 12. And this is our editorial staff place. Do you notice if Nisa has a stronger bond with your kids than maybe dads who don't take the allotted time? Definitely. I think it's been a great bond for them. Can you tell me a little bit about how you and your husband co-parent together? We try to make it as equal as possible, but I mean, with me working, he gets to do most of the housework. <laughs> he gets to do it. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't have time. And that's fine, because I sort of bring home the bacon right now. Do you think that since Sweden has been so supportive of families, 
Is that something that Swedish people have come to expect from their government? Definitely. When you speak to people like like you guys that don't have those benefits, you get shocked and like, oh my God, I don't know what I would do. Like, go to work after six weeks and who would take care of my child and who would pay for that? Like, it's weird. <laughs> <laughs> People here have a really great quality of life. They get to spend a lot of time with their children. They don't have to worry about how they're gonna make ends meet because everyone is essentially looking out for each other. Dads are encouraged to spend time with their kids. It's interesting to see how they prioritize feminism and equality, whereas in America, people probably don't even realize that that's what we actually deserve. You know, we're still essentially assuming that women don't work outside the home because that's the only explanation for why you would not have paid maternity leave is the assumption is you don't have a job that pays. You wrote an infamous article for The Atlantic, <laughs> <laughs> Why Women Still Can't Have It All. Um, could you explain it all? What I meant by having it all was simply that women should be able to have what men have had, which is a career and a family too. What I was trying to get at is equality. I'd say the biggest revelation to me after my article is that men wrote to me and challenged the idea that they have it all and said, what we have is a role as breadwinner that is just as deeply socialized as the traditional female role as caregiver, and we don't have any choices about wanting to spend more time with our family. And that means, as a government and as workplaces, we've got to make room for caring for our children. And I would insist on maternity and paternity leave. To get to real equality between men and women, we're going to have to open up choices and roles for men, and we're going to have to embrace traditional women's work because that's what we did. We said women can be equal to men, but what we meant by that was, you know, we can be our, like our fathers. We can do the work our fathers did, and we devalued the work our mothers did. And real equality means traditional men's work and traditional women's work are equally valued, and it means men can have the same range of choices as women. So to finish the business of the women's movement, we have to go forward, but not as a women's issue, as equality for women and men. And when more men start uh, taking advantage of paid leave, that changes the culture of a workplace. After meeting families around the world, it's clear. Paid parental leave is not ideologically at odds with a thriving economy. It's time for our government to finally acknowledge that. If we had 51% of women in Congress, we would have paid leave. We'd have affordable daycare, we'd have universal pre-K. And I think they would be done on a bipartisan basis. I don't think this has to be partisan. People all over the world, no matter what political ideology they hold, really believe that this time is important and sacred for families. It's a, a strange thing that we don't uh, think of it that way. I think that there is injustice to the fact that I spend my days teaching and helping other children grow, and I can't even afford to stay home and take care of my own kids. The most important family value is the value of time spent with your family. That's not a democratic principle or a Republican principle. That's a quintessentially American principle. It's truly about how do we make families work? How do we make our businesses stronger? How do we make morale higher? How do we make efficiency greater? These are all shared values and having paid leave in this country would accomplish those things.